Andy, my dude, have you heard of the magical website builder known as Squarespace? Ugh, not another Squarespace ad. I feel like every podcast is sponsored by them. <laughs> Hey, don't knock it till you try it. Yes, okay, it is overhyped. But actually, it lives up to the hype. Squarespace is like a website fairy godmother. With a click of a button, your site transforms into a beautiful masterpiece. A website fairy godmother? That sounds interesting. What makes it so magical? Well, for starters, those slick templates make anyone look like a professional web designer. Pick one, customize the colors and fonts to match your brand, and voila! Plus, the drag-and-drop fluid engine is so easy, your grandma could build a site on Squarespace. Well, she did knit me a lovely scarf last Christmas. Maybe website design is next. Exactly. And when you're ready to sell your Nana's handmade scarves online, Squarespace has built-in e-commerce. Add a store with one click, get flexible payment options, then watch those sales roll in. And when she wants to teach others her steezy scarf skills, Squarespace's new courses feature is just the ticket. Nana can set up her curriculum and enrollments and payments in a snap and become the next e-knitting influencer. Oh, wow, you really sold me with the grandma angle. Sign me up for that free trial. Just go to the nextreel.com slash Squarespace and transform your site into a beautiful Squarespace masterpiece. Well, thanks, Pete. Even though it's overhyped, Squarespace actually sounds perfect for Nana's site's needs. Appreciate the warning on the ads, though. I'll brace myself next time I listen to a podcast. Anytime. Let me know if you need any help getting that site up and running. Andy, can you believe we've almost hit 700 episodes of The Next Reel? I know, it's crazy. And with all the other episodes in our family of podcasts, we are well over 1,200 episodes of movie conversation. It's really pretty amazing that we've gotten to have these in-depth movie chats every week for over a decade now. And we couldn't have done it without our loyal community of film fans. Their support over the years has meant so much. For sure. That reminds me, we should give the merch store a shout out. Buying shirts from thenextreel.com slash merch is a great way listeners can continue to support the show. Plus, they get to support our great designs. Absolutely. I think sometimes folks forget we have a variety of shirts, mugs, phone cases, and more available. In fact, a great place to start is with a shirt sporting the Next Reel's logo. We also have that classic Fast Times Spicoli Surf School tee, or the weirdly popular Rusty's European Tour shirt. The one from National Hemp Foods European Vacation. Why is that so popular? <laughs> Search me, but we have sold a ridiculous number of those. I guess there are a lot of Rusties taking trips to Europe? We're always adding new designs based on movies we've covered, like our brand new design for a streetcar named Desire, featuring a streetcar named Desire. So if you want to rep your love of TNR and films, head to thenextreel.com slash merch. Every purchase helps us continue to have these weekly in-depth conversations. So visit thenextreel.com slash merch today. And as always, thanks for listening and being a part of the Next Real community. We've got lots more great movie chats coming your way. I'm Pete Wright. And I'm Andy Nelson. Welcome to The Next Reel. When the movie ends, our conversation begins. In just a matter of seconds, you're going to hear a classic episode of this show from back in the day when we called ourselves Movies We Like. It took us a while to settle into the show's format, so you'll notice some differences as you listen to these episodes. For instance, it takes us a bit of time to actually get into the conversation about the movie. Things like that. But we're still proud of the conversations about the movies themselves, and we think they're worth keeping in the library. So enjoy these episodes from our back catalog. And you can become part of our Discord community, learn more about the show, and find out how you can become a supporting member at thenextreel.com. So thank you, everybody, for downloading and listening to The Next Reel. We appreciate your time and attention, and we hope you enjoy the show. Have you watched Raiders of the Lost Ark recently? In black and white, with in a black <laughs> with a horribly mispaired soundtrack. <laughs> Why have you? I find it really fascinating. I think it's a really interesting study of cinema. Now tell me, this is we're speaking obviously of Soderbergh, <laughs> Soderbergh taking uh, direction into his own hands for other people's movies. <laughs> That's right. I don't know if it's directing so no, much. No, it's, it's, it's certainly a reinterpretation for sure. 
it's it's just putting it in, in a new light and i find it very interesting as a as just you know a way to study a film you know t- turning all the color off turning all the sound off and then just putting some music on to look at it purely from the standpoint of how do the images work together how are they uh, how are they cut together? How are they uh, staged and framed in such a way as to tie together? And uh, he used Raiders of the Lost Ark on this little experiment of his. Um, I love, I love how Soderbergh can get away with things like this, you know. But of course, all over his website, this posting is for educational purposes yeah. only. But uh, yeah, it's, it is the. I think it's the entire movie. I didn't actually clock yeah. it, but yeah, I think it is. Yeah, but uh, I mean, it's a great way to look at a filmmaker uh, using his craft to tell a story and watch how things are cut together, watch how uh, spacing, and we've talked about in some shows how the way that a director frames the shots and cuts them together, um, particularly in some of those, uh, you know, jiggly cam sorts of uh, films where it's like... uh, you need to find a way to keep the audience uh, oriented as to what uh, what the world is that they're in so they can place where things are coming from. And uh, it's uh, looking at a film like Raiders in black and white with no sound, essentially, um, you can still really get a sense of all the space in which Indiana Jones is, is moving around. And you can really get a sense that Spielberg, as he directed this uh, with his team, knew where to put the camera so as to tell a story very effectively, even when it's, you know, whether it's cutting fast or slow, we really constantly have a very clear sense as to where he is and the way the cutting is done really helps tie things together and make the story move in a very effective way. You know, I really agree, and I, I not, you know, I'm usually not quite prepared for you to jump so deep so fast. So <laughs> <laughs> I was ready for the witty banter, and you went full on cinephile. So bear with I me. Know. One of the things I was most fascinated with is, it, you know, just how stark uh, a, a contrast you get between focus points in the sh- in the in the film. You you really see when it, you know just how, like you you say, you know, the the way the film is cut. You see just how. Uh, focus points within the frame or that, that he plays with these focus points uh, moving from tight shots to wide shots and and I think it, it's funny how r- removing color and I'm sure this is not the only reason this this works but but more the the contrast between my experience of the film in the past and my experience of the film in this version um, but removing color really does allow you to see um, this extra uh, kind of layer of depth um, that that is otherwise sort of distracted by the flash of color. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, 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 I yeah. found myself. I found it really moving. Actually, I, I thought it was really fascinating. I did not watch the whole thing. Uh, I did skip around to my favorite parts, and and uh, the the opening sequence is terrific um you know when he when he turns around and and um, finds um, oh what's his name. Alfred Molina. Alfred Molina, oh. sp- uh, you know, on spikes. Right. Uh, you know that was uh, that was a, a fantastic uh, sequence. The chase through the through the trees, the Jovito chase through the trees is wonderful. Uh, I love the fist fight on the Nazi plane um, w- toward the end, uh, just as we run away with the Ark on the road. I mean, th- these sequences, I think, it, for me, were heightened uh, as a result of the black and white treatment and. Uh, you know, made me feel like I needed a, a drink in a triangle shaped glass. It was very classy. <laughs> very classy. Yeah. Right? It's triangle even. Yeah, Ooh. yeah. I don't know what yeah. they call those. What are they they're not flutes. What are they called? Like martini glasses? The the wide I have no idea. Nothing? No. I don't have any glasses that are triangle shaped. That's a... You know what I'm talking about. I don't know. You totally do. Martini glasses? Oh, oh, okay. Sorry, I was picturing it from the top. Well, it's yes, a, like a martini an, uh, glass, no, like right. a true martini glass. What is yeah, it called? Right, right. Is it just? It's, is it's that just a martini it? glass. Yeah. Well, that's what I needed. Yes. yes a yes. Libby glass. That's what it's called. A Libby. L i b b e y. A Libby glass is a stemless martini glass. Oh, okay. There gotcha. you go. Gotcha. There you go. And now hey, we know. Good talk. <laughs> this was great. <laughs> oh, wasn't it fun? Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, <laughs> what else you got going on this week besides uh, film nerd stuff? Uh, that's about it. You know, I, I got a, you know, I've got a, a a young child's birthday coming up, so we have a big plans for the box trolls this weekend. Oh yeah. Hey, you know what? Um, you know, uh, Mark Maron's podcast I've mentioned before, mm-hmm. uh, WTF. Uh, Nick Frost was on the show this week. Hmm. And uh, he actually did, uh, he sa- as he says in the interview, four hours of work on the box trolls, which means he was invited to the premiere. Uh, and so he was talking about how they made it. And he said, you know, it's it, he, the way he characterized it sounds a lot like cheating is you know, stop motion these days. That he, he said as he's walking through the getting the tour of the facility where they were actually making, crafting the box trolls. He said, you know, all their mouths are, they're not like clay anymore. They're like clip on magnetic magnetic movable mouths like snap on <laughs> mouths that magnet to the puppet <laughs> she said they've got hundreds of mouths what mouths are you working on today oh e64 and they grab the mouth off the shelf and i, so I found myself like laughing about that all day long yeah uh, where is my magnetic snap on mouth <laughs> it's a good episode, Nick Frost, uh, and he's a he's a congenial guy. They talk a lot about uh, they go all the way back um, to what it means to be a true Cockney. Apparently, he's five miles short of being a true Cockney uh, because he was born five miles outside of of this. You have to be born within the sound of these the bell bells or something that he's not a Cockney. Mm, the Cockney zone. The, yeah, there's a zone. It's like a hot right. zone. Interesting. Like outbreak. <laughs> You're born with the Cockney. <laughs> wow, that sounds that makes it sound really bad. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's totally not. Um, me to not I, go there. <laughs> I don't want to go to there. Uh, so anyway, check that out this week on the WTF Mark Marin show. It's good. It's a good episode. Cool. Um, I think we should tell people where we're from. Let's just jump in. Let's do it. All right. Where are we from? <laughs> It's the next reel. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, my name is Pete Wright. That over there uh, is Andy Nelson. Yo. And we spoil movies. We spoil them heavy. Uh, this week we are continuing our Stephen King uh, series. Very excited to take on the dog today. Uh, mm-hmm. But first, you should get to know us a little bit better. You hang out uh, over on the web. If you've ever been to the web, uh, you should hang out at thenextreel.com. And uh, that's where you can get to know us a little bit better. You can get to know all of our past episodes, uh, hundreds, nay, hundreds of episodes of Andy and I talking about movies. Uh, check out the uh, the Next Real Film Board. That's our special edition. We've got one coming up this very weekend. We are taking on a, a, a new classic, I'm sure, Denzel's take on The Equalizer, a modern miracle of cinema. Oh, Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just gonna say it. It feels a little bit like we're, <laughs> like, like a, a bench player. This it, yeah, a little bit. It is a little bit, but <laughs> I, you know what? We have fun. It'll be, it'll be fun. We do have fun. I'm looking yeah. forward to it. Uh, I'm <laughs> definitely looking forward to it. And uh, so that's coming up this weekend. Be on the lookout for that. Um, and you hang out at uh, at uh, Facebook or, or Google Plus or the Twitter. You can find us all at the next reel and uh, join the conversation, uh, especially Facebook. I think most of the stuff uh, really is going on over there. So uh, that's it. Now, the other place that you need to be aware of is over on uh instagram for the uh weekly guess the movie pony prize challenge someone versus the people Mm. who did it this week it was andy it was andy versus the people this week what do you think it was how do you feel i felt pretty good (laughs) uh you know it's nothing like a a strong challenge to really make me give myself a pat on the back so (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> because this one was uh, wow, this one goes. This is this was good. This wasn't quite. I mean, we've we've had some real uh, deep cut, deep tracks. Tamara Drew, that was a deep yeah. cut. Yeah, this one is that a was. this one was a classic. This is. I mean, nineteen seventy two's cabaret. I mean, I, you know, welcome. Yeah, and I actually was kind of surprised that it 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 took all the way until an image of Joel Gray 
uh, that uh, finally uh, got uh, good old Ben Lott, uh, B. Lott 2319, to figure it out, even though, as he says, he's never even seen the movie. But at least that image <laughs> clued somebody in. But, you know, there was an image of, uh, you know, uh, the silhouette of Liza Minnelli standing there. There was uh, there was the kind of the money, money, money song yeah. with all the kind of the current with all the different currencies on it. I felt like it was obvious, but, uh, you know, I, I had some good clues there. But I guess not many people uh, are out watching Bob Fosse's movie these days, but they should because it's a fantastic film. It is a fantastic film. It's one of those films that you know. It, well, it first it's it's a fantastic show, yeah. Uh, it is. And and uh, it's really that it's a film built on the strength of a of a wonderful show. And uh, uh, and Joel Gray, I mean his his MC is the quintessential MC uh, uh, for yeah. this role. He's he's the one to watch. So absolutely. So mm-hmm. yeah. So uh, good old Ben Lotz entered to win the Pony Prize. Way to go, Blot. Way to go, Blot. Mm-hmm. I'm I'm sad that uh, you know. He's been. Do we have? Do you have his comments up uh, for the the most recent uh, Stephen King, the Blot score? I mean, he didn't score it. He's not. He's not scoring anymore. No, he's not. But um, I, I don't have it up. But uh, a Creep Show, you know, he said it was it was uh, fun, yeah. but uh, I don't think it was uh, something. I think he equated it to the Twilight Zone episodes, and he which he would like rather watch. He would rather just go watch <laughs> those rather than. Yeah. That watch creep show and you know it's one of those movies I, I think depending on when you see it in your life i mean i i saw it when i was younger and so it's just kind of stuck with me maybe that's why uh, i like it so much but yeah well it's fun it's frivolous and fun we had a good time yeah. watching it um you know we should add that we're doing the uh, listener's choice coming up right it is coming up yeah we've got uh the drawing is in what three weeks yeah i think so what do you ha- what do you, what do we have to do to, to be a part of that if you want to, uh, if you want to, want us to talk about your movie and be on the show, you need to leave us a comment over on Facebook or tweet us a comment, or you know, just leave us a comment somewhere on one of the many sites we're on, so that uh, iTunes is a great place because uh, you know, obviously, comments on iTunes do help other people find us, and uh, you know, between now and when we do our drawing on uh, you know the the show around October sixteenth, seventeenth. We're going to pick one of those people out of the hat, and they are going to uh, pick a movie that we're going to talk on our Listener's Choice episode in early November. You still actually have a random number generator that you use for this, right? It's not a real oh, hat. It's, it's, it's pretty an sophisticated. Room, it's, it's, an, it's, it's, a, it's a, actually an antiquated computer from the 50s that I got on eBay for, for uh, 100 bucks, <laughs> and it fills an entire room, and I plug everybody's name in. And lo and behold, one of them junk, pops junk, out junk, together. Junk, 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 junk. It's pretty exciting. I love that. Mm-hmm. Right. So be a part of that. And you know, uh, who else? Uh, uh, we we have a we do have a recent comment on iTunes. Uh, uh, Matthew Madrano from Facebook said some very nice things. Uh, yes, he about did. Our show. He's an aspiring screenwriter, and we've talked about him before. Um. And uh, we're just very excited that he took the time to to jump over to iTunes and and leave us some nice words. He said he actually says we're number one in his book. That is very nice. Thank you so much, uh, Matthew Madrano from Facebook. Uh, we appreciate you do this, and we will keep up the good work. And we do. We also hope that your review helps others find this fantastic podcast. Absolutely. So nice. Um, I think we should do trailers. <laughs> I'm going to go first because I need first. to get this out. I just needed to get it out of off my chest. <laughs> wow. I I love I love 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 computer movies like hacker movies. Uh-huh. Immediately up to and immediately before I actually see them. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yes. Like I was so excited for Hackers the movie. Remember? And the net, and the net. I was so excited for that movie. And uh, uh, w- what was the other one? The John Travolta one with the uh, uh, what's swordfish. His? Swordfish. Oh man, was I excited for that movie! I was excited for all of those films, and they all took a bite out of my soul on viewing them. They really <laughs> did. They were just not. They did not live up to it. Swordfish, the the explosion, the ball bearing explosion in the beginning, that was novel. That was really really cool. 
But uh, those other films, there's just really too many skateboards, or uh, you know, it's just one thing after another. They were just they were just terrible. Dennis Miller, what? So anyhow, I say all that by 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 way of of unveiling my pick for this week, which is January 2015's Black Hat. Have you heard much about Black Hat? I haven't, but the fact that it's opening in January it's not doesn't great. bode well. It doesn't bode well. But here's the thing. Uh, the movie got made, clearly, because of the names attached to it, directed by Michael Mann, uh, starring Thor, Chris Hemsworth, Viola Davis, John Ortiz. It's, it's, a, it's a solid cast and a, a reputable director uh, with some cred, and it's a hacker movie. And, you know, it's like r- a lot of running and uh, hitting a guy with a table. And, like, there's just some things that are confused and energetic and really enth- enthusiastic about computers and lots of camera angles that appear to <clears throat> come from the space between the bottom of your keys under your keyboard and the the like Tron-esque sort of circuit board on which they touch, which doesn't bode well because <laughs> that's not what it looks like down there. And uh, so I wish it looked that way. That'd be cool. You and me both. Yeah. It, you know, I, I agree. Michael Mann, he's a director that I, uh, he generally is making good stuff, and it's a lot of uh, solid films, but every now and then he cranks out some that are, are just not very good. I didn't think Public Enemies was uh, good at all. Um, this one, I, I think it looks interesting, but it is that going into the computer and, you know, I don't know you f- like the the they feel the need to show how amazing the 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 cyber world works and, and you know it's just you zoom into the the wires as signals are getting transmitted and I don't know I always end up finding that stuff uh, a little silly so uh, it rarely does it work I think that uh, Fincher did a pretty good job in the girl with the dragon tattoo it wasn't quite as as uh, um, overt as it is in this trailer. No, so I, I, I totally agree with that. And I think what Fincher ended up doing was really focusing on the act of research, not the art of technology. Right? Yeah, right. <laughs> the exactly. interpretive art of technology. It's just everything I'm seeing in this trailer, It's it, you know, it excites me because of how much I want to be excited for a movie that it finally gets this right. I can't think of one off the top of my head, but I really want it to be good. I'm going to see it. I know it's going to suck. I just believe that, and, and I want to be <laughs> surprised. Uh, but I'm a sucker for these things. I really, really am. Uh, generally, it looks like a really wildly dated interpretation of quote-unquote technology by an older person who probably doesn't get it <laughs> right so like ooh, this is how technology will exactly work, yeah. exact kids love tron right uh so i'm i'm not i'm not excited about it, but i have to pick it just because of it it is what it is so january 16th 2015 you know where i'll be right after i see this movie i'll be crying <laughs> That's where I'll be crying right in, the corner. in my car, just sitting why? alone in the parking lot. Why, Michael? Why have you forsaken me, <laughs> Chris Hemsworth? Uh, what the hell were you thinking, <laughs> Viola Davis, Oscar winner? What? Oscar nominee? Oh, she was only a nominee. She's right. so she, close. She was so close. That but Meryl Streep. Seriously. Oh, I hear you. Uh, all right, your turn. Oh. Yeah, just well, a little bit of mourning. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Well, mine potentially falls into the same boat. <laughs> uh, mine is a new little uh, kind of a horror thriller comedy uh, called Housebound, coming uh, up from the uh, the other side of the world, uh, down under. It looks like it's uh, a film coming out of, uh, I, I don't know if it's Australia or New Zealand. I, I think it's New Zealand, but um, one of those two. Anyway, this is a, a an interesting-looking horror comedy about a girl who is living a life of crime. At, you could almost say a uh, bumbling burglar type, uh, although it's not quite that bad in the trailer. But she's caught, and she's put in home detention, where she has to go back home and live with her uh, kind of kooky mother, who uh, is just one of those... Uh, well-intentioned ladies, but uh, just, I don't know, just (laughs) doesn't seem to get it, like gets really excited about the technology of her daughter's ankle bracelet. 
things like that. So, I mean, there's an interesting blend of the comedy with it, and, and these characters look interesting. But the the odd thing thrown into the mix of this story is the fact that this uh, the Kylie, this criminal, um, has to go to uh, home detention, and this house that uh, her mother lives in might be haunted. And so now she's uh, trying to figure out if it's haunted, if it's her imagination, or what. I think it looks really, uh, it looks really fun, and uh, you know, I always think that when I see trailers like this. <laughs> and so it's the same sort of thing. You know, I hope that it, uh, I hope that it does well. I, I hope that it is really funny. It actually played at South by Southwest, and I, you know, I hear it did pretty well there, but I don't know if it was. Uh, I don't think it garnered any awards or anything. Uh, Peter Jackson really likes it. He said, "A wonderfully witty comedy horror that delights in scaring the hell out of you." Bloody brilliant! So, it's one of those things. I think it could be really kind of that fun horror comedy, but I also think that it could end up not working at all. But uh, I'm hoping it will. This is one, and you know I'm not keen on the on the horror generally, but this is one that I found myself actually um, actually intrigued by. I like the twist. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, the movie poster for it is great. It's kind of like a family portrait, like a painted portrait yeah. of of the girl, her mother, her father, and the spirit with a bag over its head with its kind of like, you know, rotting hand kind of sitting on her shoulder. It's, it's great. I love stuff like that. So I, I feel like it's on the right track, and I really hope that uh, I hope that it does well. I do, too. So. I didn't get quite enough funny out of the trailer. You know, if it's a horror comedy, it was much more horror to me. Maybe I should watch it again. It's definitely more horror. The comedy is very light. The comedy seems to kind of pop up in uh, just kind of the, the, the mother character. Yeah, pretty much the mother. She delivers some of her lines and Custodian everything. Custodian of comedy. Mm, yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. All right. When's it, so. when's it come out? Uh, it looks like it's going to have a, uh, a release here in the U.S. October 17th. So I'm hoping, uh, I don't know how wide of a release it will be, but uh, yeah, check your local theaters. Hope, hoping for direct to uh, vid, direct VOD. But they are obviously pushing it out just yeah. in time for Halloween. Yeah. Looks good. Yeah. All right. Uh, Andy, who let the dogs out? Nothing that lives in the imagination is more frightening than the terror that lives in Castle Rock, Maine. Cujo? Can he get us in here? Stephen King, creator of Carrie and The Shining, comes a startling vision of fear. Please, God, get me out of here. Now there's a new name for terror. Cujo. Wow. 1983 Cujo. This one was directed by Louis Teague, produced by Robert Singer. Screenplay written by uh, Darn Carlos Danaway and Lauren Currier. Uh, orig- first draft written by Stephen King himself, uh, which uh, I thought was interesting. We need to talk about that. But first, ha- have you read the book? You know, I can't remember if I read this book. I had this uh, Stephen King surge of reading when I kind of discovered him in junior high, where I read a ton of Stephen King books. And I cannot remember if this was one of the ones that I read or not. Um, I, I've seen this movie so many times that uh, you know I, I just can't place the the book. But um, yeah. maybe <laughs> I'm I'm with you. I mean, there are pieces of it that that sound really familiar, and pieces of it that really really don't. Um, but uh, first things first. How did this hold up for you on this viewing? Well, let me tell you something about Cujo. You tell me. You tell me this about that. This falls into the creep show camp for me where there was this there was this summer where my dad first 
got HBO, some neighbor kind of tapped into the little, uh, you know, wires on the telephone pole. And like everybody in the neighborhood all of a sudden was getting HBO. Oh, One yeah. of those sorts yeah. of things, you know, how they were fiddling around with stuff like that. Right. And this was the, and it was the first summer we had like a VCR and I became obsessed with uh, recording movies and then I would watch them all the time and creep show fell into that camp. Uh, this fell into that camp along with many others. And I ended up watching Cujo many, many times uh, when I was, uh, I mean, not, not when it came out, but you know, several years later. So probably, you know, I don't, you know, early teens. And I saw this a lot and I, always loved it it always creeped me out i think because at the time i could very easily put myself into tad's uh perspective and i could watch the movie kind of from the kid's perspective um and then as i got older there was a huge period of time where i hadn't seen this film in a very long time and then i ended up watching it again and uh i really i really found myself loving it still but now from the parent perspective, like the protective parent perspective, and it, it was interesting how all of that shifted for me. And uh, so I, I really love this film. I just, uh, it, you know, there's always going to be issues with stuff, but I, I really enjoy every aspect of this film. And, um, and I now can appreciate it from the different perspective of watching it as an adult and kind of watching it now from uh, Dee Wallace's perspective. I um, I was worried where you were going with that when you say I, this, I filed this with Creepshow because um, uh, on most levels, I totally don't. Uh, and that's one of the reasons I love it so much is that I, I feel like what, you know, what, what we had known Stephen King for was this sort of campy or supernatural horror. Right. And, and what we get with Cujo is real human fear. And I think that's a that that's a uh, it's unexpected in in this film. I think it was unexpected in 1983, certainly from Stephen King, and and uh, I think it uh, I, I think it's a uh, I think it's a dream of a film. I think it is really well architected. I think it you know we have uh, the the three major battles right. We have um, man versus man, man versus nature, nature versus nature. You know, I mean, it just, it, it pieces together really, really well. It's paced incredibly well. Again, you know, I, I, I love the patience of this film and I'm a big fan of patience in films generally. And I think, you know, it, it's not scary for most of the film until we get to the siege, uh, up on the farm. And I think it's, it, it just takes its time in all the right ways. Uh, the bursts of horror are, you know, by that time believable, uh, I think generally, um, and uh, I think they took on an amazing challenge of both working, discovering this kid, Danny Pintaro, uh, who was unreal as a six-year-old, uh, yeah. making this movie that, that he conjured up, uh, that that he knew like how to conjure this dark place and be this kid stuck in that car uh as believable as he is that was just a masterful performance of of this kid and the dog uh which generally you know i i have a hard time sort of believing the dog for most of it it's just like oh look it's a dog covered in snot but then the end comes along and that dog is really scary um you know i think they just they, it was just you know they were they it's a movie about dogs and kids like things you're these are these are cardinal sins of movie making, <laughs> and they right. made a, a a darn scary film out of this uh, out of this book, and and it was based on a on some very real stuff, some gritty horror, and I um, uh, I'm a big fan of this movie. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Danny Pintaro takes uh, he, he takes you to places that you don't ever want to see your own children go to. You know, I mean, it's it's horrifying watching this six year old as he as he crawls into the the back corner of the back of the Pinto when the dog leaps into the car and is like yeah. mauling his mother. Yeah. I mean, and just seeing him curl up into that corner and just like screaming and crying. It's like, oh, my God, I just don't ever want to see uh, that happen to my children because that is such a place of terror. And to know that he's this little six year old kid who finds that place in himself to act that out really just blows me away and i mean d wallace said that of all the kids she's worked with and she's worked with a ton of kids in her career especially this kind of period in her right. in her career and she um 
uh, she says they're all great to work with and they all are amazing kids but Danny is the best by far of all the kids that she's ever worked with because the places they asked him to go and the places that he went and and how he handled it uh, afterward kind of in a sense that um, as a kid you have to, you know it's hard for a kid to understand the difference between um, something that is pretend and something that is real at that age, you know, right. and, but he somehow managed to find that line and, and was able to bring that stuff out. And, uh, I mean, it's, it is painful to watch the horror in this young boy, uh, not just the, not just the terror, but also when he's having a seizure and, you know, you know, kind of starting to die from dehydration. I mean, it's, it, he does it all so well. It's yeah. amazing. He really, he really delivers in this film. And I think, you know, so much of the film is on his shoulders because he is the vessel for, as you say, he's the vessel for our, uh, characterization of, of what the fear is in this movie. Uh, you know, we, we watch him to see how scared we need to be. Yeah, uh, and um, I think it just it just dominates I mean, as a as a barometer of fear in this film, uh, you know. And I I may be kind of giving short shrift to the dog. I mean, the dog was is an amazing that is an amazing actor too. <laughs> all all ten of them or five, yeah, right, right, somewhere between five and ten of them. Yeah, you know, and and so much of it. You know, what I what I love about this. So this is you know what I I did not know this about the making of. Cujo w- was that you know as with all Stephen King things he lives in Maine and he's he has the experience he had he was having trouble with his motorcycle apparently and he asked you know he was given some advice that hey there's a guy up in the in the woods you should drive up into the woods and take your motorcycle he's a mechanic he'll fix you well, he'll fix you good and so he went up to this farm in the woods and turns out there he was there was a mechanic and he had a giant dog and that's that is the 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 seed that was the seminal moment for of of Cujo uh you know i wonder what would happen if and uh and king later says i wish i could remember writing this uh because it's a uh, it's a darn good story and i was drunk most of the time <laughs> uh which is a darn shame because it is a darn good story uh, and so I, yeah, I did not know that about this, the, the book, but apparently it is, uh, it, you know, this setting is not strictly from his head. Apparently this is, and that's one of the things that I think is, uh, is, is so horrific that a rabid dog bit by a bat, um, is a scary thing, particularly if you live in the woods of Maine. Yeah. And I guess some of the stuff that they changed is like in the book. Um, and again, see, this is something that I don't remember. So it makes me think I didn't read the book, but I guess it's in the, the book, supernatural stuff, right? Well, there, there's kind of this, uh, you know, as Stephen King is, is prone to do, there's kind of a connection to the, the kind of the evil spirit. It, there is a supernatural force. And like when, when Tad sees the monster in his closet, there really is kind of like a supernatural presence in his closet that is, uh, he, like, I, as I recall, he sees kind of these yellow glowing eyes and all yeah. this sort of stuff. <laughs> yeah. And that spirit ends up kind of possessing Cujo and that spirit happens to be kind of a reincarnated uh you, you know version of something from one of the previous Stephen King novels you know i that was something i've i've read that um, you know people have put together uh you know the lineage of that all the books take place in the same sort of Stephen King universe you know right. I, I think there's you know there's some logic to that and whether it's intended or not it's it, you know that's just sort of the way it turns out his narrative works uh, but it, it is one of the things I wanted to comment on because I actually find in the process of writing the script, uh, Lewis Teague says he he you know they there there was a lot of you know storm and drag around getting this thing written and figuring out who, which studio was going to move forward with it, but ultimately Stephen King's initial draft of the script was uh, had deviated too far from the book right. and uh, so they ended up coming back and uh, bringing in a, another writer and another writer after that who ended up uh, scaling back the script and going back to the book and and really trying to find fidelity to the book and I think to me the defining moment of the of the script that really makes this movie as strong as it is is the decision to excise the supernatural absolutely you I agree. completely agree. Oh, I completely agree. That this film relies on the strength of of the just the reality of this situation. And I think if you bring that supernatural element into it, I think it takes away the the realness, uh, you know, the sense of this is a story that could really happen to me. Yeah. 
and uh, I think that's what is so strong about this film. Yes, because this dog manifests. I know I know nothing about rabies. I've never had rabies. I've never <laughs> met anyone or thing with rabies. But what I what I imagine of rabies, I learned from Cujo. Yeah, and that makes Cujo that much scarier to watch today, especially thinking, as you mentioned, about my young kids. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Terrifying. Yeah, I think it's it's Cujo and uh, what's the other rabies? The dog with rabies movie. To Kill a Mockingbird has a dog with rabies. And uh, does an old yeller get rabies? Did you cry when old yeller got put down? I feel like I did, but honestly, I can't remember. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> did you cry when Cujo got put down? <laughs> <laughs> I cried at the end of Cujo. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Cujo. Said uh, by know, no one ever. <laughs> that's right. You know, it's funny, though, because uh, Louis Teague says that the making of this film, they really, he as a director, I mean, it, it's an interesting story how he ended up getting uh, to direct this, because Stephen King actually uh, called the the producer, uh, Dan Blatt, and said, hey, I want uh, you to talk to Louis Teague. I think he'd be a great director for Cujo because uh, they were uh, gearing up to do it. And Stephen King had just seen Alligator, which I, is, is a kind of a horror spoof that Louis Teague had directed a little bit beforehand. And I remember watching Alligator as a kid. Alligator was the just, one where they had the, they put the alligator in the toilet? Was yeah, that something the one? like that. And then it grows up in the sewers. It grows up and in then, Chicago, yeah. And it scared the the pee out of me uh, as a kid because it's one of those things that I don't know. My grandma would probably let me watch, and I shouldn't have because I, you know, there's that one scene in Alligator where the kids are all playing at the birth. It's like Halloween, I think, and the kids are all playing uh, at a Halloween party, and they're they're dressed like pirates, and they're in their backyard. It's night, and and they they're making one of the kids walk the plank on the diving board into the pool, and the kid like lifts up his uh, his eye patch and looks down into the water just as the other kids push him off, and he sees the alligator <laughs> in the pool below him. And man, that just that lived with me for a very long time. Let me I, I absolutely know it, it was it, for me. I don't remember so much that scene, but I remember attaching great meaning to flushing anything down a toilet after that because <laughs> right. the whole premise of alligator right was you take this baby alligator you flush it down a toilet and if it eats if its whole diet is rats that it, from a lab that had been discarded and injected with growth hormone of course this is going to happen to an alligator it will be giant <laughs> and it will come back up in your swimming pool and so i was very serious about things that were flushed down the toilet i was sure that they'd end up in a lab rat depository <laughs> very serious <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. So, uh, anyway, yeah, Louis, David Louis Teague. Yeah, so so anyway, he was directing this film, uh, or he came on to direct this film. Um, they actually went with somebody else, and or it went to a different studio. I can't remember, but it changed hands a few times. And he finally was able to come on and direct it after they had to get rid of another director. And so Louis Teague came on to direct it. And um, he had like two days to prepare. That was it. And uh, luckily, he was already interested in doing it from before. And so he was really kind of amped about it. So he was ready. But he's, he was so conscious of the way that people react to um, – uh, people hurting animals, uh, people hurting people in movies all the time. Uh, you know, audiences don't react because that's just kind of what happens in stories. But when people hurt animals, people have a very hard reaction to that. And so he had to, even though Cujo has rabies, it's not Cujo's fault. It's this damn bat's fault. And so the, he had to be conscious of, uh, of showing any violence toward Cujo, and and so even when when uh, D is swinging the bat at the at the dog, you never actually see anything like you never see the bat actually connecting with him, and so uh, and you never see it like when she finally gets him those the the two times that she finally gets him, you never actually see it, and it's it's just interesting to think about that in a, in a film like this where you've got this horribly vicious rabid dog that you still have to be aware of something like that. Uh, to make sure that your audience um, isn't too, uh, you know, kind of offended by the fact that you were, you know, injuring an animal on screen. Never mind the kid that the animal is, you know. <laughs> right. Right. Uh, exactly. you know, I think you have a good point. I, and I really love the way, and, you know, the credit to the cinematography goes to uh, Jan de Bont. Uh, and I, I can't remember, we've talked about Jan de Bont before, haven't we? Um, I don't know if we've talked about him, but he certainly is an interesting, uh, an interesting 
person to talk about because we have talked about cinematographers who go on to become directors. Yeah. And he's one of those cinematographers who, uh, I mean, he was shooting movies as a cinematographer all the way up into the early 90s. And then he uh, jumped over to director and he did a few, a few films. And I think he did one good one. <laughs> Which is Dude. speed. Yeah, I was just going to say, are uh, you going to roll the dice and see if yeah. they agree? Or Yeah. No, then he did Twister, yep. which, I mean, it was pretty. You know, it was fun to watch, but it was terrible. Speed 2, which was not fun to watch. Not fun to watch. The Haunting, which wasn't fun to watch. And then Lara Croft, Tomb Raider, The Cradle of Life, which was not fun to watch. So, Well, you're being a little hard on Lara Croft. That was the second one. The first oh, one right. was more the, fun to watch. The first the one was more fun to watch. That's right. Yeah. And so, uh, yeah, and then, I mean, I don't think he's really kind of returned to cinema. I mean, I guess he did he did uh, uh, shoot something recently, but, uh, yeah, I don't know. Interesting. Well, anyway, credit to for, to him, to the cinematography, and back to the way they, they give the camera to the dog, the dog POV, uh, is really interesting because, you know, you do get the subtle movements every time the dog gets hit. You know, you'll see the, the swing of the bat, and then it will cut to the dog's POV, and it will tilt right and then right. it cuts to the dog kind of sitting up and you see the dog sitting up so you don't even see the the dog's immediately re- immediate reaction shot to getting hit right you you don't see the dog um being truly injured until kind of the the very very end right right um, and and so it's an it's an interesting use of that uh, of the the camera to portray the dog i think it it moves well yeah it does and it works perfectly for what they're trying to do and yeah. you know it's. I, I think that he learned from kind of the Steven Spielberg Jaws mentality uh, of of horror film. When you need to uh, work uh, in a situation where you can't necessarily show something, using that POV can really help you. And it is. It does. It worked very effectively here. As long as we're talking about Devon, we need to talk about the uh, uh, Danny going to bed or Tad Tatter going to bed scene, mm-hmm. uh, which I think is a. It's first of all, it is an adorable sequence. Yes. Uh, where. You know, we have uh, young Tad. He's trying to get in bed. But at this point, you know, he has this imaginary fear of monsters under his bed. You know, he has a wolf under his bed or something. And so he uh, and so he plays this game that comes directly from director Teague, uh, his own childhood, where he will uh, stand at the light because the wolf only comes out at uh you know the wolf only comes out in the dark right so he stands at the light switch and then he turns out the light and he tries to jump in bed before the wolf can come out because then he'll be safe in bed uh and so he has that flash that instant flash but when the light comes out where he has to jump across the room and so they ended up building danny's room or, or tad's room twice there were two tad sets there was one for the light where the light was on and it was built at normal scale and then when the light was turned off uh, the, they had built a second set, which was elongated, a much longer room to increase the distance that Tad would have to run to get into bed. And, and above the bed, slightly above the bed, they, they had a platform where Jan de Bont would sit. And as they's filming, uh, Danny run across the room in the dark, the camera pans down and over, uh, sort of uh, under. So Tad runs under the camera as it ends up being completely uh, turned over. It's a very sort of Scorsese thing, right, where the camera is completely upside down uh, right and uh and and it does as teak says it looks like he's falling into space into the bed which ends up being a really nice effect and i think that is such a clever thing that i would never have have thought of making the room just building a whole second set uh, a second bedroom uh, right to support this single sequence and it's the sort of thing that uh, i mean it can be an expensive decision for a filmmaker to make a, a, a choice like that um, because it's only used that one time, you know, and, and it, it, uh, it's just one of those things that you have to really count on your producer and, and all your team getting behind in order to pull that off and actually be able to make it work. And I think they do very effectively, and it's, it is a very memorable moment. And as a kid, I remember watching that scene and just kind of connecting with him because – 
it is that way. Like as a, as when you're young, and you know you turn the lights off, things do feel different in the house, and it, there is kind of that very eerie sense that you're in Danny's head at that moment, and you're really kind of seeing everything from his perspective. And I think it was just a very uh, smart way to direct that scene and just help us identify even more with Tad as he's dealing with these monsters that he has to that he's you know trying to deal with even even though at this point they're all imaginary for him truly now you uh you hang out often with d wallace let's talk a little uh, bit about your relationship well, well i i wouldn't say that that i hang out with d wallace but i'm sure, I, that's, what, I'm sure that's what you told me <laughs> you think so that one the, night I, I was hanging out with my dear friend d wallace that's right that's right good old d <laughs> d and me no actually i was um uh producing a movie 10 years ago now um that uh you know it would have been a lot of fun it was kind of a throwback to 50s giant insect movies and uh, we actually had d on board to act in it and so we had met with her and, and she's a fantastic person very very kind person um the project ended up falling through but um but yeah she's she's really great and actually she came out here to the recent uh uh, Phoenix Film Festival earlier this year, and they actually screened Cujo, and I went and saw uh, the movie there, and she uh, came out and she talked. She did a Q and A after the movie, um, and it's just you know tons of stories about this film. I mean, it could fill an entire show just listening to her talk about uh, all these different stories from the set about working with the dog or or Lewis or or Danny or just anything, and you know the the you know what it was like in the pinto i mean everything it's very interesting and um but it's just the thing that's amazing is just how how um i think how amazing of an actress she is i mean she gives a i think a phenomenal performance in this film um she really goes to some interesting places um and, and you know it's it's a I mean, we haven't even talked about kind of the, the early part of the film, yeah. but, you know, you've got this whole uh, relationship issue that's going on between her and her husband. I mean, they've recently moved to this small town in Maine. Um, it seems like they were kind of big city folk. He was an ad man. Uh, and now she's kind of, uh, you know, feels lost in this in this move and is like, you know, struck up an affair with kind of the, I can't remember what she calls him, but kind of the town stud. Right, and, yeah. uh, and, um, even though she's feeling incredibly guilty about the whole thing. And, and we just get a lot of that guilt and the shame and all of that playing through in the beginning. And then as her husband kind of discovers the affair and uh, all of that works really well as she's kind of dealing with that and, and trying to figure out her place in this new world that they are in. And same thing with her husband. I mean, he's trying to figure out how is he going to make this career work for himself. One, now that they've moved to this you know, town in, uh, in Maine, and two, now that this big account of theirs is collapsing and he has to go out of town to try to rescue it. So Dee really uh, takes this performance into a lot of great directions, uh, both from the, the uh, perspective of looking at how she's handling the relationship with her husband, and then as the mother bear, when she has to figure out how to deal with this situation with this rabid dog, this very real situation. And, and Stephen King actually said uh, that, you know, he says that this is an Academy Award level performance by D. Wallace, and I would almost be inclined to agree with him. I think it's a, it's a pretty stunning uh, role for her, and I think she does great in it. I, I do too. I think she just she hits exactly the right pitch in this film, uh, it, it, all the way through. I think she's just exactly right on uh, a believable performance. Not too far, not too screamy, uh, just the right amount of screamy. Um, but but you, you bring up the beginning of the film, which I think we can't underestimate or underscore uh, this enough. The beginning of this film uh, is a very human, deals with very human fear. She is terrified of her marriage falling apart based on the, the incredibly poor decision of infidelity on her part with the, with the town stud. She is, she is, you can, you, you really get the sense that, that she is dealing with that real life fear. And, and her husband is dealing with the fear that comes with his, um, you know, that comes with his, his clients, uh, falling apart, his client relationship falling apart. Uh, th that is a, that is something we can relate to, right? As adults, we can relate to this sense of fear that comes from our relationships and our work. And they spend a lot of time in this film. Uh, it's just an hour and a half, but it really feels like uh, 
they spend a significant amount of time dealing with um, these relationship uh, bits, the nuance of the, the sort of love triangle between her and her husband and the town stud. And I think it plays so, so very well when she finally is stranded up at the farm and that becomes the payoff that, that the family ends up coming back together as a result of, of you know, her experience. And, and Daniel Hugh Kelly's, uh, as, uh, her husband, Vic Trenton, um, is, is drawn back into their marriage as a, sort of the, the protector. Right, um, right. It was it was fantastic. Uh, Christopher Stone plays Steve Kemp, the town stud, uh, and soon to be or shortly after this, uh, he and D would marry. She would become D Wallace Stone. Yep, yep. Uh, all the way up until his untimely death death in the uh, mid nineties. Yes, he died uh, died young ish, fifty three, mm-hmm. uh, and he's uh, he was in a lot of stuff. It, you know, he ended up with his IMDb is eighty four credits, a a mere fraction of D Wallace's two hundred and nine <laughs> IMDb credits. Yeah, she is a lady. Gosh, she just doesn't stop. I mean, she is a true force of nature. The way Truly. that this lady just kind of cranks out project after project, year after year. Truly. Uh, anything else uh, you'd like to say about the good? Uh, Steve or D, Steve Kemp or D. No, uh, I, I think that's about it. They're just, uh, I, I, I really love watching D in this. You know, just speaking actually to what you said about the right amount of scream and, and everything in this, uh, there is that moment where I, and this, this is just one of those moments that speaks to uh, me as a parent about the reality of being a parent, especially in situations like this, where Tad is in her lap. I think it's it's shortly after the first attack of Cujo, and um, he's just kind of curled up on her lap, just saying, "I want daddy, I want daddy, I want daddy," and she's just like, "All right, all right, all right, all right, I'll get your daddy." Yes. And she kind of screams at him, and it's that honest portrayal of how a parent reacts. It's like she's not mad at him, but it's this moment where it's like, "I don't know what else to do right now. I I, I want to protect you, but I can't. I have to, I can't figure out how." And it's that frustration, the way that she deals with that. And I I feel that that is just one of those moments that is just like pure honest performance right there. Truly. I could not agree more. I'm glad you brought up that sequence because it's one that really sticks out for me as well. Yeah. Uh, Daniel Hugh Kelly uh, had come off of this was I think his first feature film Uh, he was coming off of uh, pretty much soap operas Mm -hmm. Uh, Ryan's Hope one of my mom's very favorites (laughs) Uh, and Chicago Story he was in Chicago Story in 1982 he runs into Cujo and this ends up being as uh, D. Wallace says uh, this was a a big moment for him Uh, and he was very scared jumping into this uh, jumping into this film I think he acquitted himself quite well I think so too, and then I remember him most from Hardcastle and McCormick, which actually started in, in 1983. Oh, Hardcastle and McCormick, I'm so that's so great. Yeah, uh, that's like that is what I remember him from. Is, wow, is, I, he was I watch McCormick that show all the time. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, oh my such a fun show. goodness! I hadn't even put that together. Yeah, that car. What was the car? I, it wasn't I don't like remember. a Ferrari, right? I mean, what I, was that it was, car? It was a funky car, but it was cool. Wow. It was like it's got that big sloping front and everything. That was fantastic. Yeah. Wow. I want we I, I wonder if there's like a kit. I wonder if I could turn my <laughs> turn my old Saturn into a hard castle and McCormick car. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I'm looking it up right now. Uh, so uh, anyhow, that uh, that he was in that, and he. So what else did he do? Go ahead. It was the Coyote X, a prototype sports car. Oh, there you go. Oh, That's very cool because he stole well, he- it. He ended up just in, I mean, he's another person, just been lots of TV. I mean, he's done a lot of TV. He's somebody who's remained in TV quite a bit, and Dee's done a lot of TV. Um, but uh, he does pop up in, in films every now and then, like Star Trek Insurrection. Yeah. He was in that. He was in uh, uh, The In Crowd. He was in, uh, what else was he in, movie-wise? Um, well, he popped up a lot in some in some higher um, ticket TV. You know, he was he did uh, he showed up in uh, uh, the West Wing. Uh, he did guest appearance on the West Wing in Las Vegas, and mm-hmm. so uh, can't forget Walker, Texas Ranger. Oh, there you go. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
but I don't remember him much in other film. No, I mean, he's definitely in them, uh, but it seems like he's kind of just kind of a, a playing kind of a B-level actor in things like Chill Factor with yeah. you know, those god-awful Cuba Gooding Jr. Skeet Ulrich movie. You Coming know, things up like in that. Sex, Death, and Bowling and Toy with a capital Y. Wow, interesting. Currently filming a drama about two lost souls from disparate backgrounds who find each other amid the desperation and glamour of Los Angeles. That's right, forging an unlikely friendship that spirals into what? Tragic chaos. <laughs> of course. I sort of feel like this is like the the autocorrect game. <laughs> Just whatever word comes next. <laughs> right, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> we'll make a movie about it. Like to see it? Here it goes. <laughs> uh, well, it's, it's funny. It's funny that you say that because you know, tying back to Cujo, uh, I think at the time this came out, a lot of critics kind of uh, dismissed this as just another uh, standard uh, story that Stephen King cranked out. They said, "Okay, so Stephen King puts X character into a Y situation, and uh, you know, in some in rural Maine." And then, the, but the you know they have to get through this situation, and people were feeling like he was just kind of doing kind of a, a writing by numbers, as they said in some reviews that I was looking at. And uh, it's funny because now, and I, I mean, I didn't I didn't see this when it came out. I had no clue of any of the reviews at the time. I I, and I didn't see any of them until now. Um, I I just have always loved this movie, and and looking at the reviews now, I'm just like, man, I I don't know if it's like a time thing, or or is this something where it's just because I, I'm just really connecting with it that it works so well. But I, I mean, I, if, even some recent reviews, people don't seem to think that it's that good of a film. So it's yeah, I mean, it's still technically a rotten in uh, Rotten Tomatoes, yeah. right? I mean, people yeah. don't people aren't liking this film. Um, and and that's really disappointing. And I, I don't know if it's just it doesn't hold up well because it's not scary enough or not violent enough or it just is not a film that ages well or people are just not watching it with as keen an eye. Uh, but uh, it, it that's that's frustrating. It is because I think there's a lot of stuff going on here. And I, I don't think it uh, – um, plays the kind of the standard horror tropes and maybe that's what some people uh, don't like is that it's like you do spend like the first half of the film dealing with kind of the relationship story and yes we see Cujo as he's kind of slowly devolving into the monster that he'll become but uh, but really we don't have any attacks until 45 minutes into the film which I think is is a, a tentpole of the strength of this film yeah and I completely agree it's uh, but I you know for some people who are you know wanting their horror to kick in right away? I mean, that could be one of the problems that they have. Right. I don't know. Right. I don't know what these yeah, people just, are. Just browsing some of the reviews, simple and scary. In fact, too simple and not a great horror movie. Uh, you know, I, I I guess I can see where that comes from. But again, I think that that goes to the sort of raw style of of this film. I mean, it really back to to what I'd said in the beginning. It it really centers on these three uh, three contentious relationships, right? Man versus man. It's the it's this human relationship dealing with the affair. Man versus nature. It's the it's dealing with the dog versus everyone else nature versus nature it's the dog versus this rabid bat like you end up seeing the 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 that this very simple uh very simple turns of fate end up creating uh you know dare i say a monster and i think that that makes it a, a really uh sort of uh, a film that's that's worth loving a little bit more than than many do well uh... Lewis it, Teague had worked with um, John Sayles on Alligator and a couple other projects, and he said that John Sayles would tell him that when you're making a horror film, you need to have a high RHB factor, and RHB, he said, was real human behavior. And in order to sell horror, that is exactly what you need. You need to have uh, just honest people that you can connect with because you're putting them into a situation that is otherwise not necessarily believable. And uh, this film really strikes me as a that as one that is full of RHB. There is a lot of honest human behavior, and yes, you know you put your 
your two characters into a car for the last half of a film. It is very claustrophobic. You're not moving a whole lot. I mean, you're sitting in that Pinto for 45 minutes, essentially, waiting for them to figure out how to do it. I can see from some people who don't necessarily get connected to the characters how it can be, okay, well, there's one way. We're going to have to get out of this somehow, and she's going to have to fight the dog. Yes, but there's more to it than that because you need to invest with that character so that you, you're really connecting with it and you're you're going along for the ride with Donna and Tad. Yeah, absolutely agree. Uh, absolutely agree. We should talk about the music. Yeah, I I love the uh, uh, the uh, Charles Bernstein music in this. I think uh, um, I mean he he's a composer that's done a lot of interesting scores. I uh, I I really like what he does here. It's very creepy, and he's got a nice kind of uh, mournful kind of tune for the family that works really well. But then it um, he's got some just downright kind of relentless and and scary music that pops up for the dog and i I think it works really well he really does it's one that that goes in and out of being able to actually hum along with it and that's kind of a wonderful treat for a horror film i mean it's a it's a there is there is some uh there are sequences in this score that are are downright catchy yes yes the uh I think the production design is great in this film. Uh, everything from the farm, which is this great creepy farm uh, you know, that I would be a little hesitant to go visit. Let alone uh, get out of my car and start hollering for the mechanic who lives there. <laughs> right. Um, all the way to the the you know the trashy friend of of the mechanic. Uh, I I can never get over like the the way that he carries his trash out to the the back of his house and just like dumps it into a trash pile it's like man that's just a really awful way to live yeah uh, no you know maybe it's good that (laughs) that cujo takes him down first i don't know (laughs) oh yeah but uh guy comtois did the production design for this and uh, i i just i really do think that that paired with the cinematography um really hold this world together i think so too uh movie was filmed in gosh what was it california mendocino and uh, the farm is in petaluma mm-hmm. which doesn't look anything like this anymore <laughs> a little a little yeah, less a little bit less yeah. yeah uh production design who else uh, anybody else on your list um, I th- let me just look. I think that may be all of. Oh, the editor. I, you know, this is an interesting situation. Um, we've talked about editing before, and how uh, how important it can be. But we don't. You know, there's. It's like hard to kind of tell. Like, well, yeah, it was edited well. Um, but this is an interesting example of how the director Lewis, when he came onto this, he had an editor already on from the previous uh, team, and he went in to watch the the dailies as the editor was cutting, and found that the editor was just not cutting them in a way that made it interesting and it wasn't working. And so he actually got rid of the editor and brought in Neil Travis to take over and do the rest of the editing for the film. And Neil uh, started from scratch and took all the footage and basically reworked it and turned it into something that ended up really working and i do think that they find the right ways to to build to the jump scares and the end just all the tension and the drama and even the relationship moments where you've got just those beautiful simple shots of the of the two characters and uh, you know also the dialogue and how minimal it is but neil travis found the way to kind of bring the tension out in all of those moments through the entire film and i mean he's an amazing editor he's you know 47 credits i mean we've got dances with wolves which I believe he won an Oscar for, uh, Terminator 3, Patriot Games. Uh, you know, he's done Clear and Present Danger. So he's a guy who's been around for a while doing a lot of this stuff. I think, yeah, he did uh, He did pretty much all the Clancy things so, until he died, right? Some of All Fears, Clear and Present Danger, Patriot Games. And uh, did he do Red October? I don't see Red October on his list. Hmm. So maybe not that yeah, one. Yeah, maybe but not that one. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I I absolutely agree with you, and he's uh, uh, clearly an accomplished. I'm sort of surprised we haven't talked about him before. Yeah, uh, he's definitely somebody who's been he's done quite a lot of good stuff. Yeah, right. Yeah, and uh, then uh, the last person I wanted to talk about was uh, Carl Miller, who is the animal trainer, and he t- we don't have an opportunity to talk about animal trainers very often. Uh, on the show, but I mean, considering the the amount of work that went into uh, to training 
all the however many Cujos that were in this film, uh, especially considering that Carl came on and, and he was telling Lewis, he's just like, well, maybe we can change it to a, you know, a golden retriever or something because there aren't really any trained St. Bernards. And, and so he really had to start from scratch with all of these dogs, training them to do things. And he had all these different dogs that would do certain things. Like he had a dog that would be the growling dog and another that would be the running dog. And he had one that would be the one that would jump on the car and kind of try to paw on the glass and everything. And so the way that he had to work in order to really train all these dogs, I mean, it really is kind of like a dog whisperer type of guy, according to uh, all the people who talked about him. Is just he was an amazing person who really kind of tapped into the whatever consciousness the animal had and found a way to get them to do what the filmmakers needed them to do. Yeah, that is uh, a, a stunning feat in this movie, particularly when you look at just how close the animal action is to the actors in many sequences. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I think if you look really closely, there is actually a, a shot in the movie where you actually do see a man in a St. Bernard outfit. <laughs> Do you really? I don't. I didn't notice it. You'll never notice it because it, 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 it happens so quickly. A man it, in a Saint. But well, that ruins that. Talk about breaking the fourth wall. <laughs> you know, it's the shot where uh, where Cujo slams his head into the side of the car. Oh, because they could never get Cujo to do that. So they actually have <laughs> a man in a Saint Bernard suit kind of banging his head into the car. <laughs> Hire a guy so. dumb enough to do that. <laughs> Okay, get this dog suit and just slam your head into the side of the car. Brilliant. <laughs> oh, oh horrible. <laughs> uh, all right, let's talk about uh, how it did. Yeah, this film, uh, this was kind of the year of Stephen King, actually. This is one of three movies that came out in 1983 uh, that uh, were based on Stephen King novels. Uh, this, along with uh, The Dead Zone and uh, Christine, all came out in 83. Um, this one did okay for itself. Uh, we're going to talk about those other two movies coming in uh, future episodes, so I won't jump in, into any comparisons yet. But Cujo uh, cost, from what I see, about $8 million, which in today's money is uh, just not even quite $19 million. So, I mean, it's, it's still a pretty modest budget. And uh, domestically, it ended up making about $21 million, which is um, not quite $50 million. So, yeah, it did well for itself. It's, it made its money back. It wasn't anything amazing, but it, uh, it did uh, turn a profit. It, it, it's, uh, yeah, it, it makes me even more sad that it's not as appreciated as it is uh, today. Yeah. I, I, want, I want this movie to have been more successful. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Well, they blame in the book, because the book wasn't one of King's uh, bestsellers, uh, no. or maybe it's not as popular as some of his others. And they actually blame it on the realism and the fact that Tad dies at the end of the book. And so when King wrote his first draft of this, uh, of the screenplay, he, that was one thing he changed, is that he made uh, it so that Tad lived. And that's one of the few things that when, he wrote, when they went to the other screenwriters, that's one of the few things that they kept that, that King had put into the story. And I think that does help the story, but still, I, it does pique my curiosity as to what it was about this film that didn't draw people in. Yeah, yeah. All right, well, let's rank it and see what happens. Let's do it. All right. Head over to flickchart.com slash the next reel. Join up, friend us up, and let's see if your stack rankings match up with our stack rankings of our favorite films that we've talked about on the show. Okay. Well, this is a perfect fitting start to this. Cujo or Carrie? Um, I'm, I may be a minority here, but I would say Cujo. I, I, again, it's what I grew up with, so I would say Cujo. But I mean, Carrie is a yeah. damn fine film. It's a it's a damn fine film. Yeah, Cujo or Twelve Monkeys. Hmm. I would, I mean, I would probably watch Cujo first, but I think I would still put tw pick Twelve Monkeys. Yeah, me too. That's too bad. I know it is. I know it is. Cujo or Twenty Eight Days Later. Twenty Eight Days Later. See, I would go Cujo. Oh man, it's so far from me. You, it's I, okay. hands down. All right, all right. Cujo or Sweeney Todd? Oh, interesting. Talk, how I'm, you're you're going to vote on this? I'll do Cujo. Me too. All right. I did not expect that. Wow. Cujo or Blood Simple? 
Mm. Mm. King or Cohen's? Yeah. Uh, I'm gonna go Cujo. Yeah, I, 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 yeah, I could almost go either one on this one, but yeah, I'll go Cujo with you. Cujo or Barton Fink? More Cohen's. Cujo. Okay. Yeah. Me too. Cujo or the Born Ultimatum? Number three. I think you're gonna say Born Ultimatum. Yeah, I I could go either way though. I think I'm gonna go Cujo. Okay, I'll go with you. Oh, look at that! Number fifty-eight out of one hundred and fifty-one. All right. I All right. About that, I feel good about that. It made it into the top fifty-nine. <laughs> I'll Just take that. Where I was expecting I'll it. I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> where do we go from here? Well, we're going to be uh, stuck in 1983 for a few more episodes. As uh, next week, we're going to talk about the Dead Zone. Oh, I do like this film too. I do too. That's a good one. It's uh, David Cronenberg. David Cronenberg. I did you watch much of the TV show Dead Zone? You know, I saw an episode or two, but I never, I never, uh, it wasn't that I didn't like it. I just, uh, you know, it was a timing thing. Yeah. Well, it's an interesting one. I, I think it's one of, uh, you, you know, it's, it's the one I did, that I saw where I discovered Christopher Walken. It just sort of happened at the right about the right time. I don't know whose mistake it was that I ended up watching this film when I did, but I was young <laughs> when I watched this film. And uh, I, it has also a special place in my heart. Nice. Yeah, looking forward to it. Good. Any other news for the people? Are we done? I think that's it. Just make sure you go comment somewhere so that uh, you can be entered into our listener's choice uh, drawing. That's true. You should do that. Mm. Yeah. I'm going to go to bed. All right. I got this bad problem that I got back I'm going to deal with. Bad it's all scorpions. <laughs> scorpions all the way down. Scorpions, bats. <laughs> Particularly positive review from the Amazon. All right. I'm, I'm going to do that this way. This is a four star. And the title is called, Will the Idiots Please Stop Posting Reviews Here? <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay. Yes. Shane says, to all you folks that are complaining about a St. Bernard being the wrong choice for this role and that it was too cute to be scary, um, that was the point. Sheesh. How could so many people miss that? It's the fact that a big, lovable dog has suddenly become a threat that makes this film so spooky. Man's best friend has suddenly become a monster. Had they used a Doberman or Rottweiler, everyone would have been like, well, yeah, they're killers. No surprise it turned on them. Most good horror works on the premise of the benign becoming the terrifying. This movie is the epitome of that. Also, a Doberman or Rottweiler wouldn't have been that threatening. Well, I think they actually probably are pretty threatening. Dobermans especially are small enough to send rolling with a well-placed kick. Have you ever kicked a Doberman? They need a large dog that would be able to dent a car door with its massive skull and take three hits with a baseball bat. Get a clue, folks. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> I think I don't know that Shane's ever kicked a Doberman. Uh, yeah, he may have. Sounds serious, though. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, Interesting. Well, what do you got? I've got a one star by Carmen Thomas. Oh. Very short and to the point. And, and all caps, I will add. So I feel like I should scream, but I'm not going to. But just <laughs> okay. imagine me screaming. I'm imagining it now. Not what I expected. I prefer dogs that are not possessed by evil. <laughs> Gave it to my nephew, and he loved it. <laughs> I also prefer that. <laughs> Gentlemen yes. prefer dogs that are not possessed. <laughs> well said. Uh, but my nephew loved it. Well uh. said, Amazon. <laughs>
Andy, it is hard to believe that we have been having in-depth weekly conversations about movies since 2011. You are telling me. Producing this show week after week requires a ton of work behind the scenes. If you'd like to help support our efforts, one easy way is by using our Originals page when shopping for books and movies that we've covered. Just visit thenextreel.com slash originals. Your purchases made through our links give us a small commission at no extra cost to you and allow us to keep having these great discussions. I love The Next Reel Season 4. Do you know why? I don't. Why? Because we got to talk about my favorite movie, Terry Gilliam's Brazil. That's not even an adaptation. Uh, No, but it was such a great part of our our great Terry Gilliam series. And a few others in that series were adaptations, like The Adventures of Baron Munchausen, adapted from Raspi's stories, and La Jete, which inspired 12 Monkeys. Oh, right. And and for our Man With No Name trilogy, we saw how Sergio Leone's A Fistful of Dollars was basically stolen from Kurosawa's Yojimbo. We added Labor Day to our Jason Reitman series, adapted from Joyce Maynard's novel. Oof, there's one we'll always regret. Our big Stephen King series covered adaptations like The Shining, Cujo, Christine, and Stand By Me, great horror, and coming-of-age tales. Another Coen Brothers adaptation, too. We got to talk about how they turned Homer's The Odyssey into Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? For our holiday series, we did The Bishop's Wife and The Poseidon Adventure. And who could forget seeing Alec Guinness in the adaptation of Kind Hearts and Coronets during our series dedicated to him. We really need to do more of his films. Truly. We had our first film noir series with classics like Double Indemnity, Detour, and Out of the Past. And our black and white cinematography of James Wong Howe series with The Thin Man, Sweet Smell of Success, Seconds, and King's Row. So many adaptations. Oh, you're not kidding. Dive deeper into these originals and more at thenextreel.com slash originals. Every book you buy helps support our show. Get the full list at thenextreel.com slash originals and start reading today. 